Thank you. Bro. Okay. Now, you see, this is another example of solutions on the shelf not being applied to problems on the ground. It does take consciousness, cooperative consciousness, and it does take uh, an understanding of the bigger picture beside what you get when you buy it in a co-op, the bigger picture of an alternative economy as if people mattered uh, first. I've been very interested in consumer co-ops for years, and we pushed in the Carter years for the establishment of the National Consumer Co-op Bank. And you'll be pleased to know that when we got it enacted, there was a White House ceremony. Its main problem were there weren't enough applications for loans. There weren't enough co-ops applying for loans. They finally found enough housing co-ops. That was the big absorber. But in terms of adult education co-ops, food co-ops, communication co-ops, there was enough organizing out there. Anticipating this, we put a provision in the original legislation uh, called the development unit, which was designed to develop, go out in low-income areas and actually help people with technical assistance and development. Even that didn't do much. Then Reagan came in and he wanted to corporatize. He wanted to cut it loose. And uh, so they cut it loose. And now it's doing some good work on housing co-op, but it's redefined co-ops to include Dunkin' Donuts who are members of a wholesale co-op or something like that, you know, commercial co-ops. And it's pretty much run by a commercial mentality management which is where the executives came from. Now this all comes down to, we don't study co-ops in schools, we don't learn about their history, we don't know that in Switzerland two uh, food co-ops have almost 50% of the market, uh, insurance co-op in Sweden has 30% of the total market. <laughs> I mean big, really big. Modregon is a producer and a consumer co-op in Spain and that has gross revenue of about $4 billion. They have machine tool factories as well as all kinds of consumer co-ops. Law schools don't teach consumer co-op law except the University of Wisconsin Law School. So the law students get, graduate thinking there's only one model of commercial enterprise other than partnerships and which is traditional incorporation, traditional corporation. And so it goes. But, you know, when Steve makes a, a film like that, you know, it begins to pick up. You see what Minneapolis St. Paul is doing. And um, we can only wish for the best. I think co-ops have turned the corner. Uh, I think they're now starting to grow again. How many of you knew that during the oil crisis, when there was the, the, uh, the cartel, OPEC cartel in uh, 74, and then the price went up in 79, that 1% of all production, refining, and gasoline station sales, 1%, were co-ops, farmer co-ops. In the 20s, the farmer co-ops got fed up with the oil industry, and they drilled for oil, and they refined it, and they had pipeline, and they sent it. It sounds like it's small, but it's really quite a lot of petroleum when you consider the overall consumption that was never publicized during the oil crisis. No one ever said, you know, why, why are we relying on big oil companies who are exporting oil to get a higher price from the US at the time and creating artificial scarcity and jacking it up even more in terms of the pump. Nobody, one thing about co-ops, they're very bad at public relations. They don't know how to toot their horn. But anyway, that's the co-op uh, form. Before we go into the question, what would you do with $15 billion and in one year? I was thinking of starting a list, and the title is, Why Are We Tying Ourselves in Knots in This Country? When we don't have to, when we are in charge. For example, why are we tying ourselves in knots in the most wasteful, corrupt healthcare industry system? 
pain, death, injury, inscrutable bills, denial of claims, nightmare redundancies, overpriced drugs, drugs that don't work, drugs that aren't tested, imported materials, subsidies to the gougers, the drug companies, insurance companies. Why are we tying ourselves into knots? Why have we tied ourselves into knots, saddling our next generation with $1.2 trillion of student loans? Why have we set up a system where corporations and the Department of Education are profiting from student loans, until recently charging 9%. It's down to six and a quarter at a time when interest rates are minuscule. How much can you get on your savings? Why are we tying ourselves into knots where people are desperate to take care of their own kind, their children, their parents, their grandparents? Very little support structure. If it is, it'll put you out of business into bankruptcy in terms of trying to hire 24-7 help and so on. And you get penalized because you don't get maternity leave, you don't get paid sick leave, you don't get paid family leave. In the Netherlands, you can take off a year to take care of your grandparents, paid. They have reset their economies as if people matter. We have re reset our economy to gouge the people as if only corporations matter. I mean, do they suffer because they allow people to have these decent livelihoods? Of course not. Can you imagine the absence of anxiety in Canada, knowing that you will never lose life savings, knowing that you will never be denied health care for your children or your, yourself? knowing that you'll never have to work overnight trying to figure out the damn bill, which is full of redundancy and fraud, and you can't figure it out because it's in code and nobody's there to help you other than an ARARP hotline? Why are we tying up in knots trying to militarize our foreign policy and police the world when we no longer, thank goodness, have any major enemy? Why are we spending half of the discretionary budget of the entire federal establishment, not counting Medicare and Medicaid, on military programs? Why do we desperately seek for new enemies, inflate the gravity of a few criminal gangs, slam them in a way that kills a lot of innocent civilians and breeds hatred, and slams them in a way that glorifies them so they recruit more, and it becomes a glamorous thing for desperate young men to join al-Shabaab or al-Qaeda in Yemen or al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia or ISIS and so forth. Why are we tying us, ourselves up in knots watching our crumbling public services? Have you been to some of the inner city schools? Have you seen the broken desks? Have you seen they have to spill over into the corridors? how they don't have a decent cafeteria. They don't have books sometimes until October 30. Why are we tying ourselves into knots? It's called convenience. It's called citizen disengagement. It's don't bother me. And we ought to get fed up with each other when we see that kind of attitude. It's a juvenile attitude. It's an immature attitude. It disgraces our courageous forebears coming right back to Western Massachusetts. Shame on us. Someone once said, Freud used guilt and Jung used shame. I prefer shame <laughs> as a motivator. Now, do we have any political figures talking like this? This is disgraceful. They're afraid to talk to the voters about what the voters should do, about what the citizens should do. A country full of solutions? You don't think we know how to do housing? You don't think we know how to do renewable energy? You don't think we know how to cut our energy waste in half by efficiency? We've got the engineers, we've got the scientists. Talk to David Freeman. Freeman, how many of you have heard of David Freeman? Okay, 
He is the greatest energy expert in the United States, which is why you've never heard of him. You have these bloviating idiots on television Sunday. They don't know anything, but they are glib. David Freeman started out as an engineer with the Tennessee Valley Authority. He rose to head the Tennessee Valley. He used to argue with me against, he was for nuclear power. And now he tells me that I persuaded him to be against nuclear power, which he calls a death technology. He then went on to head the San Francisco utility, closed down a nuclear power, Rancho Seco, pushed for renewable, pushed for efficiency. Then he went to Los Angeles and ran the municipal water utility. And when Enron was going crazy and the rates were going crazy, remember that, in California and deregulation, not that, not that utility. And then he became a consultant to Governor First Cuomo. And he went up to upstate New York and he ran the utility there. And now he's 88. And he is writing a book, and he's basically saying this. At 3% a year, based on a gradual abolition, abolition of fossil fuels and nuclear, the target is within 35%, 35 years, 3% or so a year, or 30 years, we become all renewable and efficient. No more fossil fuels. Keep them in the ground. No more nuclear. Efficient, technologically possible good for foreign policy, good for diminishing global energy wars, good for decentralized energy, and above all, good for community self-reliance. Why are we tying ourselves into knots like this? We're the, we're the people. We're, we've got the Constitution with us. We've got the votes with us. Why are we tying ourselves into knots, being afraid of our own children and letting them be delivered into the hands of the corporate marketeers? where they begin learning how to nag us to buy this junk, this violence, this Nintendo games, instead of playing with them in the backyard, instead of playing hopscotch and playing, you know, all these little games we used to play that don't add up to the GDP, do they, like a Nintendo purchase? Because they're free. The best things in life are free. If the sun wrote a letter to the earth, what would the sun tell us? You dumb idiots. You're digging up the earth with congealed solar power, once plant life, and poisoning the earth and poisoning the workers and poisoning your food and your, all, your air and your water. When I give it to you every day free, I'm already giving you 98% of your energy. If you don't believe it, you want to turn me off and see how fast you freeze to death? Why are we tying ourselves into knots, delivering the next generation to these commercial racketeers? Are we too busy to pay attention to them? Have they got us in an employment whirlwind where we have to be away from home and commute 40, 50 miles a day and hold down two jobs? You make the list yourself. It's outrageous when a tiny effort, 1% of the people reflecting public sentiment can turn it around. How many people play these hobbies? And they're very exciting, they're very rewarding, people love them. We have to have the, the civic equivalent, equivalent of, of hobbies. That's what we need. We need people who go to meetings like this and they come away and they don't say when they're asked, how was the weekend? They don't use the word interesting. They don't use the word concerning. They use the word serious. Serious. We have plenty of people who are interesting. Plenty of people are concerned, very few people who are serious in terms of their pursuit. And these are pretty talented people. Your engagement tells me that 
you can go out and multiply yourselves more than you already have, and you can start new waves of civic action and advocacy. And get together in your living rooms or in your auditoriums and start showing what can be done. We have enough examples around the country that prove this point. Just had one here on tires. Quite a few people get killed because of defective tires, tread separation, so on. Everybody has a role. Some people have a wholesale role in advo advocating for justice. Some people have a retail role. When I started writing on auto safety, I got tons of letters from lemon owners. And I began to realize I could never catch up uh, at retail. I had to go to Washington and get legislation that prevented the frequency of lemons and required recalls and allowed the consumer to sue under the Moss Magnuson Warranty Act and get trouble damages. So some people work retail, some people work wholesale. Some people work with high multiplier effects. Some people show that some of these multiplier effects need refinement or replacement in the crucible of retail civic advocacy. We all have our excuses. And the excuses sound pretty plausible because one of the ways the 1% control the 99% is to induce them into feeling powerless so they can make excuses for themselves. Why try? It's futile. How many times have you heard that? Why are we tying ourselves into knots when other countries who don't have anywhere near the wealth, science, technology, innovation, do it better. You should ask that question to people. I'm really addressing the people I hope you'll address. Pardon me if I use you as conduits. You know, we've all been to a lot of meetings and symposiums, and they sound, ex they sound they're really interesting. And I have nothing against personal self-improvement. How can I? Becoming an effective civic advocate requires personal self-improvement. It requires reordering priorities. It requires a way to avoid the personal implosions by having a larger mission in life. This book uh, was on the table. This is, I think, our, our best book on cor controlling corporations and restoring democracy. I didn't write it. I just did the introduction. I don't agree with all of it. They were a little cool on third parties. But <laughs> this is when they were getting beat up in 2004, you know, by the 2000s. And uh, I'll give you just a little story here. A and I'll, I'll, I want to go into the elections for a moment. Uh, we are, if we don't think for ourselves, we will become victims of political servitude, what I call political servitude. We become political slaves. By that I mean we are told by two parties who monopolize the scene, who exclude competition, who harass competition, who rig state election laws against competition. You got two choices. That's all. Pepsi and Coke. You got two choices. And if you don't like either, you can vote for least to the worst or stay home. When we accept that, we become unconscious purveyors of political bigotry. The word that symbolizes political bigotry is spoiler. They call spoilers people who are trying to challenge 
the two-party duopoly and change it. The two-party duopoly is spoiled. How do you spoil something that's already spoiled to begin with? But think of the arrogance. And it helps to have a little history. Because when we're called spoilers by liberals and progressives who are trudging to the polls disgruntled with the corporate Democrats who, def who dominate the party, the Hillary Clintons and the Bill Clintons and others, and when they agree with you on the policies you are advancing, say, as a Green, and they still call you a spoiler, and they vote for the Democrats and lose all bargaining power because they signal in April, May, and June with the polls that they're going to vote for any of the candidates if they're the Democrats because the Republicans are worse. So they don't pull into the progressive arena the Democratic nominees. Who's pulling the other way 24-7? The corporatists on both parties. Now, old tug-of-war theory has it that if you're pulling in one direction and the other guy isn't pulling at all, somebody's going to win. And it isn't going to be you. The, the one who's not pulling. So here's a little story. When this was being written, the authors asked David Corton to give a blurb. You know who David Corton is? He started Yes Magazine. He also wrote the book, When Corporations Rule the World. He bought into the spoiler on 2000. And he wrote a letter to the authors and he said, unless you drop the Nader introduction, I'm not going to give you a blurb. <laughs> of course, they didn't drop the introduction. And he didn't give me a blurb. Two, three years ago, he wrote a book on how to turn the economy around. And I called his publicist up and said, I'd be very happy to read it and give you a blurb. I read it, and I gave him a blurb. I went out of way to give him a blurb in order to give him a message. We're both on the same side. And he's a least worster. He's in complicity with the worst of the Democratic Party because he makes it happen. He doesn't offer an alternative. He doesn't offer a poll. He doesn't say to the Democratic Party, I'm going to condition my vote. I'm not going to say, you got my vote because the Republicans are worse. Why should they ever give you the time of day? Why should the Democrats ever look back? They got you by a nose ring. So let's take at, at 2000. I have a list of some of the smartest people in the country. They're smart politically, smart academically, smart scientifically. One of them is a Nobel Prize winner. And they're all the same on this conclusion. Nader Leduc cost Gore the election. Now just think of this in terms of a brain lock. These are people who've written books. They're sophisticated analysts. Here's the brain lock. And I must say, I had sort of that years ago myself. They look at the two parties. And the difference before the Supreme Court stopped the Florida recount, which was ordered by the Florida Supreme Court, how's that for interfering, by states' rights conservatives on the U.S. Supreme Court, 537 votes. Difference between Gore and Bush. I got 98,000. Every other third-party candidate got more than 537 votes. Buchanan got quite a few thousands of votes. Now watch the brain lock. There were at least 20 sine qua nones, any one of which, everything else being the same, would have put Gore in the White House. Okay? If he just got Arkansas, everything else being the same, White House. Blame the Green Party. 
if he got Tennessee, his home state, where he had his headquarters and he was a senator and representative, he'd have been in the White House. Blame Nader and the Green Party. 250,000 Democrats in Florida voted for Bush. Blame the Green Party. They messed around with the ex-felons, you know, that I mentioned earlier. Blame the Green Party and Nader. The Supreme Court 5-4 political decision wouldn't have happened without the Green Party. Blame Nader. And on and on it goes. The shenanigans of Jeb Bush and the Secretary of State would the remember the butterfly ballot? Okay, that was a very confusing ballot. That's why John Nichols wrote this book, Jews for Buchanan. Because they were so confused in those, count in those counties by the ballot that, that they inadvertently voted for Buchanan. Well, do you know that the draft design of the butterfly ballot was submitted by the Republican Secretary of State to the Democratic chairs of the three southern counties in Florida, and they approved it? Blame the Green Party. And on and on. Now, this is an alibi. The Democratic Party doesn't want to look itself in the mirror. They want to blame somebody. They want to scapegoat somebody. So I go to the next stage. I say, did you know that I gave all my issues to the Democrats and the Republicans? On paper, orally, take them. I want you to run with them because that's what I'm running for on the issues. Minimum wage, take it. So we, they wouldn't push for the minimum wage in Florida. They wouldn't push for the minimum wage in Ohio. Those are, you know, key swing states. And where? That was in 2004. Kerry wouldn't push for the minimum wage in 2004 in Florida. I went to his people. I said, look, I'm going all over Florida. This is a popular issue. Minimum wage was five bucks. There was an initiative by ACORN to take it to six. And all the fast food industry was putting ads on, stop, 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 don't vote for it. It'll cost jobs, you know, all that. He wouldn't take a position. And it won 70 by 72% with no ads. See what I mean? The other thing that's important is I don't really care about the Democrat Republican Party. That's not my priority. My priority are the damned and the deprived and the beat up. That's what it's all about. And I'm supposed to care for a corrupt Democratic Party that tells me get out of the way, don't run, when they turn their backs on millions of people and allow trade agreements to ship whole jobs and industry to fascist and communist regimes abroad? I'm supposed to get out of the way and let the Democrats and Republicans sell our precious elections to the highest commercial bidders? On and on? And yet, to this day, you see these people saying, you cost Gore the election. <laughs> well, you know who thinks I didn't cost Gore the election? Al Gore himself. He knew why he lost. He knew a lot of reasons why he lost. The important thing here is when the Green Party is accused of causing the war in Iraq, I kid you not, I had a legal reporter for the New York Times tell me on the telephone, if it wasn't for your run, there wouldn't have been an invasion in Iraq. So I said to him, you know something? You have a level of causality that would make a trial lawyer very happy <laughs> if, if he didn't doubt your evidence. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, Gore never would have invaded Iraq. I said, well, I'm glad you have some retroactive uh, clairvoyance here. Um, but do you remember in 1998 when Gord and Clinton shoved a resolution through Congress saying toppling Saddam was a top priority in foreign policy? Not the top, a top priority in foreign policy. 
And do you know that Bush used that in beating the drums against doubters in the Congress? But more important, did you know that the Democrats had the votes to stop him cold <coughs> from invading Iraq in the Senate? And did you know that they could have stopped his tax cuts? All the bad things that Bush got through Congress, Democrats could have stopped. If they had, this, if they had the nerve of a John Boehner or a Mitch McConnell, doesn't matter. You're a spoiler. It is so insistent that it induces not anger, but pathos to watch it operate. Because it's totally unchangeable. I have not seen one of these people ever change except a few who watched the documentary Unreasonable Man. And they heard the Harvard Law professor provide the data and so on. They said, well, I went into the swing states. Well, I spent 28 days in California and two and a half days in Florida. That's not exactly a swing state in California, right? I was down there, and he could have won Florida with one change of policy. He was taking money from a rich guy who wanted to buy an air, a military airport and turn it into a development because it was surplus. And the people were up in arms around that area. Because I went down there, just that was my half day there, and I said, why isn't Gore coming out for this? This is a lot, a lot of people are upset by this. They said, because he doesn't want to upset his big donor. I'm supposed to be concerned about that? The thing that begins to give them pause, I'll get you in a minute. The thing that gets to be in pause is history. And I say, well, aren't you glad there was a Liberty Party in 1840? And enough voters quit the Whig and Republican and Democratic Party and voted for the Liberty Party, which was the only party against slavery? Aren't you glad they came out? Well, yeah, I guess so. What are they going to say? No. So how about the women's suffrage parties? Aren't you glad some people left the Democrat and Republican Party enough to vote for the women's suffrage party? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, what are they going to say, right? Aren't you glad that those farmer labor parties, the popular, the, the popular populist party, the greenback party, etc., aren't you glad that what they proposed for a more humane industrial society a fairer treatment for farmers, uh, regulation of railroads and banks, the 40-hour week, the progressive tax system, uh, the precursor to Medicare and Social Security, all floated by third parties. Aren't you glad that if some decided they weren't going to go for the least worst between Republican and Democrat? So I'm, some of you are, have mentioned to, uh, to us that you're still having arguments with these people. So I'm just trying to give you the attempt to clarify their mind and be as rational in the analysis of elections as they presumably are in so many other areas of their life. The other thing that's important on elections is to raise the question, how do you become a smart voter? How do you become a smart voter? And what, what are the ingredients of a smart voter? And that's a good dialogue, because we automatically assume that a voter knows what he or she is doing. And you know, who are we to say, you're not enough of a smart voter? And in one of my books, which we don't have here, I have a chapter on, on the smart voter. And one way you're a smart voter, other than doing your homework on the record, one way you're a smart voter is you never let the politician think you're a single issue voter. The more, vote, the more issues you present to a politician, the less the politician will manipulate you. It almost works like magic. So there are ways where we can teach ourselves more and more how to be a smart voter and not be gulled by a few slogans like God, gays, and guns. 
That's uh, my evening sermon. So somebody has somebody has some questions. Yes. Yes. That air base, was that homestead that got hit by the hurricane? I think it was the homestead. Yeah. I'm not absolutely sure on that. Uh, I think it was, though. Yeah, yes, Carol? Well, this year, um, that's going to die very hard, the thing that you're responsible and it's spread out to where, you know, this year, right before the election, I was accused of being responsible for the Iraq war because I worked for your campaign. And there are a lot of us that sort of relish it. To me, this year's been very significant. 10 years since 2004, we were in court, how many places? 114 courts, just trying to get on the ballot. Yeah, we were sued we were 24 sued. times in 12 weeks. I watched our New Mexico Attorney General and Secretary of State perjure themselves in court over Ralph's petitions. I mean, I lost all faith in the electoral system as a result of that. It was a RICO, it was an organized crime activity that the Democrats took on that wasted so much time and money. And mm -hmm. so many people have never recovered from it. Well, on the other hand, I found use of the phrase political bigotry, it, it, it pu pulls them up short. They want to know what it means. And then it opens the door for the narrative. Uh, however, I don't want to exaggerate this. You know who I'm talking about? I'm not talking about guys in a New Haven bar when someone tried to walk, come in from Yale and call me a spoiler. And the guys at the bar said, what, what are you talking about? This is a democracy. Anybody can run. At that level, they don't think that way. This is a liberal intelligentsia. That's what it is. And you know they command the posts of the media on their side. And they write for Nation and, and Progressive and Washington Monthly and New Yorker and, and so on. And they get on those sh talk shows. It isn't a rank and file. They're the ones. And it's the academic liberal intelligentsia, so, so to speak. What needs to be done is to tell people to get over it. And the way you do that is you start out with one question. Do we all have a right to run for election? If they say no, that's the end of the discussion, right? If they say yes, then you say, well, since we have an equal right to run for election, big or small, then we have an equal right to try to get votes. OK. And if we have an equal right to try to get votes, we're going to try to get votes from one another. OK. Then we're either spoilers of each other, or none of us are spoilers. That's the sequence that works. Because you go in terms of equality under the law and equal rights and so on. And when you put it in that framework, it's different. I'm not that worried about the liberal intelligentsia. It's not like they've been winning lately. Um, they, they don't have a message. They're out of touch with the rank and file uh, more than any time in, the, in their history. And so are a lot of leaders of labor unions, by the way, even though they would deny that. What I'm concerned about is the uninformed, gullible voter. And I, I want you to read, if you ever read a book about why people in Western Virginia and West Virginia, poor people, people go off first and die in wars overseas, why they vote consistently for politicians who s steadily betray them when they go to Washington. And the, the best two books I've seen written by a West Virginian who spent 20 years working around the country, and he came back home. His name is Joe Badgett, and the first book is called Deer Hunting with Jesus. And the second book is called Rainbow Pie. And if you think Hunter Thompson is a unique writer, he's better. He's better in many, many ways. And he, he just died a couple years ago in his mid-60s. And he epitomized, other than in his mind, he epitomized how they damaged their health with soft drinks and eating the wrong grease stuff and so forth. 
And he would talk as if he was part of them, because he was part of them. Only, he was unbelievably insightful about power and the deployment of power. Uh, okay, can we go? Do you want to talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, go ahead. I really have um, three things that I'd like to ask about. My brother is a history professor. When I told him I was coming to this weekend, he said he promised he wouldn't campaign in the um, swing. swing states. And uh, you sort of spoke to that, but not, not quite. I never promised. Uh, I promised I'd campaign in all 50 states, which the other guys wouldn't do because they go red state, blue state. You run for president of the United States, you, got, you should campaign in every state, Hawaii, Alaska, Maine, Florida, and so on. Uh, it's just that I thought I'd get more votes by spending more time in a place like California than Florida. It wasn't, it wasn't to protect the Democrats. It was try to get to 5%. So we would go for the next round with, with, with uh, roughly could have been $12 million of election campaign funds off the checkoff. And that's what that Harvard Law professor documented. Uh, you, can, you can get that off Netflix, can't you, uh, the Reasonable Man? Yeah. It, it's one of the few films that actually changed people's minds on this issue. And you'll see how they do it. They didn't sugarcoat anything. It was balance. OK. It was a good the other question, I mean, uh, I want you to talk a little more about um, uh, the elephant. <laughs> it think, stop thinking of an elephant guy. Oh, the Lakoff. Lakoff. But I, I also want to add, I mean, this is more relevant to the election. Yeah. Why didn't Gore and his people say, count all the votes? Well, why didn't they, you remember in Michael Moore's film, Fahrenheit 9-11, you remember when uh, he, he literally, the, the Black Caucus sent people over to the Senate to raise the issue on the Supreme Court decision and so forth, whether it was constitutional itself, because under the Constitution it should have gone to the House, and so on, and he kiboshed it. And I think the reason why he did it is he didn't want to be a sore loser and he was thinking of running again. That's the only reason I could think he did it. That was so chicken. Yeah. Well, first of, all, first of all, it disrespects the voters. I mean, look how, look how the Democratic... He betrayed me. Yeah, that's right. Here's how the Democrat Party disrespect the voters. In 2012, they didn't run anybody against John Boehner in Ohio. Now, think what that says. That says to the Democratic voters, we really don't care about you. We're going to put our money elsewhere because Boehner's going to win. So why give you a choice of a Democratic nominee so that you can connect and talk about it and not be, in effect, orphaned by your own party? They have, they have no respect for the voter. And so what did, what did Boehner do? He came in with 94% of the vote, and he spent all his time raising funds and fighting Democrats in, in, other, in other districts. These people should be fired. You've got Steve Israel, Nancy Pelosi, and Steny Hart. They're three-time losers. I just put out a statement. I'm saying adhere to the basic principle of baseball. Three strikes and you're out. Step down. But no, they, he's going to step down, Steve Israel. Uh, he's the campaign chief in the House because he's sick of it. But those two, they're not going to step down. They'll keep losing and losing and losing. That's the sign of a decayed party. You fail and you don't get replaced. That's why so many labor unions were corrupt, because the bosses kept staying on, corrupt, larding their own pension funds, and you know, you've know you read about all that, and they'd go into their 70s and 80s. And the advantage the corporations had was they had a retirement. So they had to get new people. Sign? There's no flunk. There's no flunking grade. You take an institution where there's no flunking grade on the part of the leaders, you can predict decay. Yeah, someone else? Yeah. What about, um, speaking to that, what are your thoughts on term limits? I'm for term limits, but 12 years, not six years. 12 years in the office. 12 years, six terms in the House, two terms in the Senate. 
because by then they have either worn out or they sell out. And only, only two people, in my experience in the house, exceeded that 12 years and didn't wear out and sell out, and that was Henry Waxman and Ed Markey. And then Markey began to wear out. Waxman never seemed to wear out, but he retired. Huh? Yeah. I'm talking more, you know, about our issues. So, someone who hasn't asked or made a comment? Tell me, who hasn't made a comment or asked a question? Okay. Why not? I mean, I'm used to standing because I'm a Granger. Okay. <laughs> you were taught to stand when you were dressing around. Um, I had read a, a book. Um, I can't remember the title, uh, so the, the author's name, Decline and Fall sometime this past year. And there was a discussion in there about the role of consensus in decision making. And this author uh, put it out that really that's why uh, <coughs> Occupy Wall Street uh, just sort of fell apart because there was no accepted uh, means mm -hmm. to control the decision making <coughs> and to make any progress. And so the whole thing just fragmented, and uh, you know, the there were the, the, no decisions were really uh, uh, achieved. Most of the police sent homeless people there, and they couldn't turn them down. So and that really, that really diverted them. So I'm, I'm cool interested in there. what you think about the consensus model, or how in a in a group yeah. when you're coming together and and there is a lot of energy and passion, but um, how do you how do you build something that actually people can feel that they can move forward and really take, work together on Well, something. I thought it was very attractive to have a consensus model and they would have these little, uh, what do they call it, the, when they, mic, mic, what? Yeah, yeah, and it was nice. The question is, at a certain level, there's gonna be disagreement on serious strategy. So what the consensus model does is paralyze it because it doesn't pass the consensus model. And the consensus model is, in most cases, 100%. It's not 90%. And so you have to face up to the puzzle, right, the dilemma. Uh, maybe you could have consensus on a certain strata of you know, how the thing is organized, whether there's going to be a, a medical aid or a legal aid or... Uh, who, who's going to police it at night, who's going to take turns and all. But there comes a point where a small number of people just have better sense of strategy. So what do you do with that? You jettison it because they can't get 100% consensus? The other problem with the consensus is the greatest problem of democracy when you have total justice. You ready? You see it in small towns. Like in my town, player in my town. There is no factory on the hill. There is no big business plying its trade in town hall. They're gone. The textile mills are gone. The clock company's gone. There's no big, powerful labor union throwing its weight around. It's a town meeting form of government. If we don't like the selectmen, we can go to town meeting and then go to referendum it's complete democracy. They don't have to walk very far to the voting booth. Sometimes it's right out their front door. There's no problem of knocking on every door if you can't raise a lot of money. 3,000 households. It's got a nice lake. Houses around the lake and then the downtown. <laughs> and they don't show up. You see? That is the ultimate test of the citizenry. When there is no excuse, there's no money imbalance, there is no disparity of power, and they can't be bothered. So a third of them will vote, and the town uh, selectman meeting is lucky if it gets 40 people. And that's what we have to face up against. I have not read any political science literature on this.
guys. Because it's always about imbalance of power and greed and exploitation and suppression and so on. The other thing that happens, and you'll resonate with this, and it goes to the points that, that you're trying to make. Here's what happens. What if the consensus is busted, not on the merits, but on personality conflicts? Totally non-relevant personality conflicts. How many of you have experienced that? Huh? It's a nightmare, right? It isn't that they really disagree with you, but uh, they didn't like your arched eyebrow. They didn't like where you come from. Uh, you might have not given trick-or-treat to the kid at Halloween. Who knows what, what's going on here? Uh, they have an ego, and you happen to challenge them, and they don't like to be challenged uh, on an issue. That's, that's the problem. Now, uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have that problem nationally. We have it at the state level. We've got plenty of disparity of power to, 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 to focus us on. So a long answer to your question is, I think we need a consensus on leadership. And once there's a consensus on leadership, leadership has sufficient authority to, to move the whole thing forward. And that doesn't mean you're stuck with leaders. You've got to recognize that the purpose of leadership is to produce more leaders, not more followers. But you can't deny leadership. Because if you deny leadership, you deny a variety of skills, which no one all has. Now, you, you can't even. They did what they could do given their limitations in, in over 100 communities, Oakland to Wall Street. Uh, let's give them a lot of credit. They did that. They didn't scare Wall Street except at the beginning. And boy, did they ever scare them at the beginning. I mean, they fingered them. And they, didn't ne they never scared Congress. Congress was an impervious bubble. Like, why didn't they? Because they weren't interested in Congress. They weren't interested in elected representatives. However, you know, given their means, I mean, they were in their 20s, late teens, almost shoeless, you know, descendants of Woodstock, <laughs> right? And they fingered the 1%. They put that in our, in our lexicon. So, you know, you, you've got to be a, a bit, uh, you've got to be a bit considerate. However, they had the eye of the mass media, which, as you know, is priceless. And they didn't know how to carry it forward. They didn't know how to shift it to other groups. They didn't know how to go for the minimum wage, which is the best issue that could have had them going, with 70 80% behind them. And they could have circled the congressional offices back home. And they had the eye of the media. It would have been wonderful. We, we put it right on their table with a phone call to 300 of them around the country. And they said they couldn't agree more, but he said, you, you got to understand, we're nowhere near organized to even go to first base on this. Here's something I heard. Yeah. That, uh, uh, Bloomberg branded by Obama that he might have to crack down on the people there. Yeah. And that uh, Obama said, do what you have to do. And then that's why Bloomberg endorsed Obama. You know, I wouldn't doubt that. It's a plausible thing for Obama to do. Yes. Yes. I just uh, want to know your opinion of Bernie Sanders. Also, Who? Saunders. Huh? Oh, oh, Bernie Sanders, the Lone Ranger. My opinion is that he's a, a, he has very good policies. He speaks out on the Senate floor, very good on drug prices. And talking about Canada, health care, single payer, but I can never get him to respond to us. We can't meet him. He doesn't return the calls. As I said earlier, it's a complete puzzle. Um, and as a result, he can't multiply his influence. He's not a net worker inside the Senate. Um, and he's not a net worker with all the citizen groups around. I mean, we had the major conference on corporate reform in 2007. Who, who did we want as our chief speaker? Bernie Sanders. He said, well, if the Senate is not in session on Thursday, I'll be there. It's right up the street, you know, half a mile. Well, the Senate adjourned, and he didn't show up. He'd gone to Vermont. I mean, it's just, it, it's just rude. 
but it's more than rude. It's that we don't need Lone Rangers. We don't need Lone Rangers. We've got plenty of Lone Rangers in the Senate. We need people who can build. We need people like Teddy Kennedy who could build coalitions. We don't need Lone Rangers. Lone Rangers just make us feel good. They never win anything, hardly. So if you know if you know Bernie Sanders, tell him to explain this. I mean, when he went on the floor of the Senate, remember that 12-hour great speech on corporate abuses? I called him up, and I got an aide. I mean, I knew him before he was mayor of Burlington. I called him up, and I got an aide. I have never ripped into him, by the way, publicly. I called him up. And I got his aid. I said, can I talk to Bernie, please? So he put it on hold. A minute later, he comes back. Uh, Bernie is tied up right now. I said, well, give him the following message. I want to congratulate him on a spectacular demonstration of progressive statements. And I want to urge him to turn it into a book. Have him call me. Never called me. Called him back, never called me. I mean, this is what it, it is now in Washington. If, if, if the senators who we worked with in the 60s and early 70s behaved that way, we wouldn't have any of these laws. We wouldn't have environmental laws, the OSHA law, the Freedom of Information Act. We had people like Proxmire. You go down and you see them and you talk to them and you plan. People like Magnuson, Nelson, Ribikoff. Congressman Rosenthal, John Moss in the House, one of the greatest legislators in our history. I mean, what are we doing here? Fooling around with idiosyncratic traits? So why do they like this? Huh? Why do they like My only explanation is that they don't want to be pushed further than they are. They think they, they've pushed the envelope, the progressive envelope, and they don't want to be pushed or criticized from the left. They're very often, you know, working with people in the middle and sometimes in the right. Uh, but that's my only benign explanation. Now, most groups don't want to talk about this because if you send dues to, to environmental groups in Washington or consumer groups, you're not going to want to hear that they have no ability to access their friends in the Senate, right? I don't play by those rules. That's, that just, that's too debilitating. You have to lance the boil. Some cases you don't get anywhere at all. I don't get anywhere with, it takes, it'll take me six months to have Elizabeth Warren return my call. And when she does, she hugs me. And I mean, it's like old times, right? But you can't operate that way. You've got to be able to get them quickly. They don't have that many people on their side who know how to build power on the outside. I do feel better about her, but both of them, I think, have chickened down on foreign and military policy. Bernie decided a long time ago he, he was not going to take on the Pentagon or APAC, and she took the APAC oath here early. Uh, well, she was run by the, 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 uh, a consulting, the Grunewald Group. That's one of their roles. The first thing they do when they take on a client is say, we're going to raise a lot of money for you, but you've got to take the oath on APAC. Just like the other side says, we're raising a lot of money for you, but you've got to take the oath on NRA. Uh, however, you know, domestically, they're terrific. I mean, corporate power is a central issue, so I'll, I'll settle for that. Yeah, yeah. Can you, can you walk us through the advice that you give to people, not what you would do, but what the advice you give to people who are under you when they get opportunities to talk to the congressional or senate senatorial staff members to begin the dialogue on issues they don't care about? Yeah, first they try to get a, a listening staffer. Sometimes they start with an intern. And they give them a briefing paper. And they show them why they should be interested. You know, they could show them the poll. Like we did this, we started from scratch with the minimum wage. Believe it or not, this should be the Democratic Party. We should have to try to get the, this is FDR, you know, signal achievement of FDR in the 30s. And uh, we, we take all the pluses for the minimum wage restoration, 30 million workers, and then we take all the objections and we rebut the objections and we, we say, you want to 
talked to the conservative Ron Unz in California, who's got a great website on why conservatives should support a minimum wage, less turnover, greater productivity, and less public assistance, taxpayer public assistance. Uh, and, uh, and also, the taxpayers should not subsidize Walmart in terms of wages. That's what these big box stores do. They make us pay the portion of the wages that they should be paying their own workers. So, so we do that, they do that, and they try to have lunch in the cafeteria, going Dutch with the staffer. They try to get a reporter back home to do something on it, or maybe a reporter that's, that's national. They try to do a little radio, which is easier. They try to show that it's in the interest of, the, of their superior uh, because XYZ in the Senate is for it, and they'd appreciate the person's support. There's a, there's a, a, a book here see, on lobbying, how to do lobbying. We had, that book was written 25 years ago by the, the now head of Common Cause. And uh, it gives you, that's what I mean, there's all kinds of wonderful manuals on almost everything in terms of civic advocacy, which makes it easy for classes, after school classes, or, uh, you know, a kind of adult education classes. I mean, nobody can stop you from doing this, you know, in your, in your community. And sometimes community colleges will have you do it at night uh, under their auspices. Do you have a library or um, a website where you have organized all the books and all of the, um, you have just so much information? Yeah, there, you go to uh, info at nader.org or info at csrl.org, csrl. And, uh, or you go to citizen.org, that's public citizen. You can see how early they got the domain name. It's a nice name, citizen.org. And you'll, you'll see a lot of the links and more, th more than you'll ever need. And, and, and a, lot, <laughs> a lot of these uh, areas, a lot of distilled experience. And now you don't even have to ask for it in the mail. It's all, on, it's all online. Uh, all right, so can I get into another area? Okay, citizen assets. Okay, you're talking to people who feel powerless. What are the assets that we have? Well, I'm just gonna run through some of them. Number one, we have the vote, okay? Corporations don't vote, at least not yet. They're not that much of a human being. So we have the vote, we have the numbers, we outnumber them. We own the, the largest wealth in the country, the commons, the commonwealth, and we can move to control it. But we don't even make the most of cable access. We're now being filmed by cable access. There's no commercial station is going to film two and a half days or so of this session. It's cable access. How did cable access come around? Because there were a few people when the cable companies wanted enabling legislation, and in effect a monopoly, in various parts of the country, companies having a monopoly, the people uh, I'm talking about said, well, what do we get for it in return? And what they agreed to is to fund the studio and equipment and you know, cable access. Some of them are quite impressive, some of them are semi-starved, uh, and they need more advocacy to get it out of the cable company. So we, we have uh, cable access. We could have our own audience network, so we have our own media. You really can't have a democracy worthy of the name if you have to rely on a commercial media. It's not possible. We have other assets as well. We have community colleges can be used as assets. We can develop a system where we can uh, test our water and test our food at public university labs and community college labs. It's, it's not that difficult to do heavy metal testing of the local drinking water, if you're suspicious, you can, the students should learn that. That's part of their education. They should learn how to, how to do that. There are physics labs, bio labs, and, 
and uh, uh, and what? Chemistry. And chemistry labs. Uh, and public universities have an obligation. Most people never even think of using them. We have government labs that you pay billions of dollars for. The Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the Argonne Laboratory, Livermore. Uh, there's one in Long Island. What's it called? Brookhaven. Yeah, Brookhaven. Nobody ever says, hey, these are our labs. They're contracted out to big companies that run them, but so what? I mean, that doesn't mean they don't have a reciprocal obligation to do pro bono work uh, for people who need them, around them. Uh, we have a number of assets, which I'll just leave you with. Uh, we have the assets known as Congress 101. What's, what's Congress 101? What we do is we get in community colleges, there's 1,800 of them, we get professors of political science who have uh, courses on government, we have them renovate it and say it's, it's Congress 101. That's the students forever, <laughs> they can't wear them down because they keep coming every semester, we'll study Congress right now. We'll study the two senators, the representative, their record, their absenteeism, who gets money to them, what their votes are like, how they handle people back home, how accessible they are, and they put out a report. That's part of the course. And the report is streamed everywhere. Everybody. They don't have to have a press conference anymore. It would be nice. But that is an asset. And I guarantee you, that course will be the most important thing in the minds of those representatives. Because that's the only watchdog. And uh, the, con the members of Congress will try to fight back. They'll try to charm the president of the community college. Don't you know I got you a grant to build this new building? And that's going to be a problem. But people outnumber this. They, they've got the force to do it. And they can prove that the students will learn skills of monitoring Congress. They'll be very motivated because they'll have the attention of the senators and the representatives. And they will feel a higher sense of their significance, and all for course credit. What's there not to like? You're paying for it. Why not get something back? So you can create these kinds of assets in a relatively modest, modest manner. One of the things that Congress 101 would be is to force the member of Congress to put their voting record on their website. Only about 10% do, because they don't want you to know. So they'll steer you to some murky Library of Congress website, which is hard to, to retrieve. The surveys show the number one thing people want out of a congressional website is a, is a, is a voting record. So you can create these assets out of the basic fact that you're the voters, it's we the people, you outnumber them, and you, you're, you're right there in the arena of action back home. They don't care what's in the Washington Post. They care what's in the Greenville paper. So you've got them in a very sensitive uh, place. Somebody had a question? Do you have any other assets you want to? Yeah, any other assets? I just had a very general question. I'm going to ask it first. Okay. And it was also based on your sermon. Okay. What is your perspective on the covered vision? what this country is about. I know the Declaration of Independence said our purpose is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, whatever that meant. But what, why don't we split apart? What, holds, what are the bonds that are holding us together? I know this is a very philosophical, generic question, but yeah. I think about it a lot. What is holding the country together with all this stuff going on? Why doesn't it split apart? That's a good point. There's some people that want, don't want to hold it together. They want to secede. Texas is full of people who want to secede, to which I say, Bon voyage. <laughs> I think we're too. I think we're far too big a country, um, and uh, Texas has not contributed <laughs> to our democracy. I said this in Texas, by the way. Okay, first step: necessities of the people. We can have a basic standard of living for everybody, including an initial savings deposit when everybody's born. 
That's the first step. You get rid of poverty, you get rid of all this deprivation, anxiety, self-immolation, all the conflicts internal, domestic. Now, you don't get rid of domestic abuse entirely, but a lot of, a lot of these conflicts come uh, from poverty. I think, uh, I think Mark Twain put it very well. He said, how many of you have heard of Mark Twain? Do you know that Mark Twain House in Hartford gets 60,000 visitors a year and Elvis Presley Graceland gets 500,000? <laughs> and they both created entertainment, right? Okay, you're not talking about Immanuel Kant, okay? All right, here's what he said. I'm trying to go through his sayings. Let's see. Be good and you'll be lonesome. Always do right. This will gratify some people and astonish the rest. When in doubt, tell the truth. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. I was born modest, but it didn't last. If books are not good company, where will I find it? To err is human, to digest divine. We ought, we ought never to do wrong when people are looking. Never tell the truth to people who are not worthy of it. Always, obo always obey your parents when they're present. <laughs> a full belly is little worth, a full belly is little worth where the mind is starved. That's interesting. Nothing so needs reforming as other people's habits. Character is the architect of achievements. Always respect your superiors if you have any. An uneasy conscience is a hair in the mouth. There is no sadder thing than a young pessimist except an old optimist. <laughs> the man with a new idea is a crank until the idea succeeds. And, I can't hit something on, oh, the lack of money is the root of all evil. So he turned it around. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so the first is necessities, okay? Then the second is a phrase that John Gardner knew, used. He said, we should have a society that allows people to f fulfill their life's possibilities. And he told me he worked hard to find that, just the right phrase. And so, see, that allows variety, choice, but it's an upward push. Life's possibilities. And you got to be impressed. And I'm impressed more and more by people when they are confronted with realities of life come down the same way again and again. There's a basic sense built in of people of fair play. And uh, I don't want to Pollyannish it because you, know, you always can give examples to the contrary. But I'm more and more respecting tradespeople, uh, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, uh, people who put roofs on homes and really know their business. And, and it's really very refreshing. You know, all the screw-ups in the military procurement, all the things you see, and how all these rich and powerful people screw up again and again. By their own standards, they screw up and uh, just get away with it. These are people who get up in the morning and they really do a job. Uh, and if they don't do it, they come back and do it. I'm not talking about plumbers, electricians, and carpenters owned by big companies, you know, employed by big companies. I'm talking, you know, small town. They just can't face people if they, if they roll them over too often. So again, it's what Wendell Berry said. When you know where people are producing your goods and services and they're nearby, you know about them you can hold them responsible. You can get them to do better. But if they're 6,000 miles away, filtered by a, a giant multinational corporation and cruel subcontractors, you're out of it. You don't know. I mean, most people don't know that 80% of the ingredients in the medicines come from China and India. Why? Don't the drug companies make enough money? Don't we give them enough tax breaks and free research and development? 
110 Americans died because there was a contaminated blood thinner in, imported from China uh, several years ago. They died on the operating table. You know, there's, there have been contaminated fish, defective tires, remember? That one from China, the defective tires that came in? Yeah. So, um, you know, we can go into more detail, but you know, when you're facing such penury and poverty and just uh, all the things that we should be ashamed of, I mean, let's go to that level first. Someone else? Yes? What can be done about Citizens United? What can be done about Citizens United? Forget it. Forget it. It was bad enough before Citizens United. It's going to be more money. Let's start mobilizing the vote. And you know who told this very well? You remember David Bratt in the spring? He toppled Cantor, Eric Cantor, the second most powerful politician in the House of Representatives under John Boehner. He's a college professor, Randolph-Macon. He knocked on the doors, homes, apartments, steady day after day. He was outspent 27 to 1. And he beat Cantor by a sizable margin. And he was on Fox News that night. And he contributed to the Dictionary of Political Insights when he was asked, how'd you win? You didn't have any TV ads. He says, money doesn't vote, voters vote. And liberals are obsessed with big money, and it is a problem. It's a problem. But they are so obsessed, they're not focusing on mobilizing the voters because they have an alibi. Now, someone at, at dinner raised the question of when did the Democrats flip over and become like the Republicans in raising money? And it happened in 1979 when Tony Quello, a congressman from California, was head of the House Democrat Campaign Committee, and he persuaded the Democrats that they can raise a lot of money from business interests and business PACs, and up to then, they raised more money from labor than business, and Republicans raised much more money from business than labor. It was a three to one ratio. It's now like 30 to one and growing. And you could see the correlation was uncanny. The more they begged for money from PACs and the quid pro quos and from corporate cash and Wall Streeters and fancy restaurant fundraisers, the decline in congressional hearings that we wanted, the decline in returning our calls that we wanted, the decline of wrapping the knuckles of regulatory agencies who were captured by the, in the industry that they're supposed to regulate. So I'm not saying it's not important. I'm saying that you can't make it an obsession to the degree that you don't do what David Bratt did. Knock on every door, knock on every apartment, and chat and talk with the people. Day after day after day. Yes? What happened to that other avenue to pass the minimum wage bill with, I think the petition, or the discharge petition? Yeah. The 1010? So what happened with that? Yeah, in late February, the Democrats to get around Boehner, who blocked the vote in the House on a minimum wage because he knew he was going to lose, left, right. They put a discharge petition out. And if a majority of the members of the House sign it, it goes to the floor automatically for a vote. 195 Democrats signed it. They needed 23 Republicans. And from late February until October, they never mentioned it again. We, we, we looked it up. We're the only ones who were mentioning it. The Democrats themselves never mention it. Congressman Bishop, who was the person assigned to put the bill in the hopper, never mentioned it, and last Tuesday he lost his seat in Long Island. So you see the patience that's required for these people? However, it's starting to happen out there. People aren't waiting. They're doing cities, San Jose, Santa Fe, San Francisco, Seattle's going for 15. You reset the economy 
so that people can get a fair day's wage. You reset it. It's, it's out of kilter, like a medieval serfdom. It's out of kilter. They didn't have to be treated that way. All right, let's, let's get back to this here. Now, I wrote this book, Only the Super Rich Can Save Us. How many have read that, by the way? Oh, well, I tell you. Exercise and stamina. <laughs> it's a work in fiction. And basically, here's what I posited. Right after Katrina, you remember the bodies bobbing? They couldn't even collect the bodies. It was absurd. It was a complete breakdown. And sitting in his living room in Omaha was Warren Buffett. This is fiction. Warren Buffett, day one, day two, you got people fleeing New Orleans on the sides of the road. There's no food, no health care, you know, desolate. They got the kids there. It's cold at night. And so he gets fed up, and he hires whole trucks full of food and shelter and, you know, tents and so on. He goes down himself with this whole convoy. And he starts passing out. And the word up the line was, there's some millionaire, billionaire from Omaha who is helping us out, thank goodness. And he gets to an extended family. And the grandmother, very, very worried about the kids, she sees him coming with the help. They had health care workers and so on. She grabs his hands and she says, only the super rich can help us. That's the title of the book. So, can save us. So he goes back. He drives all the way to Omaha. In his mind, he's saying, only the super rich can save us, she said. I am not going to leave my wealth to a posthumous foundation. That was his plan in reality. He was going to create the biggest foundation in the world after he died. He says, no, no, I'm going to get going now. So he gets 16 multi-mega-millionaire billionaires, many of whom you know, Ted Turner, Yoko Ono, so on. And each one of them has their own constituency, right? Yoko Ono is the art. Barry Diller is TV, radio, mass media. William Gates Sr. deals with the legal profession. Bill Gates' his father. And so each one of them had a Rolodex in an important sector in the economy. That's how he chose them. He got them to Maui, as I mentioned, and they plan around the table. One year, money is no limit. We're going to organize the country. Clean elections party. We're going to mobilize the workers. We're going to push for solar energy. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And because we're, we've got this plan to take on Wall Street, we're going to do it all in private for five months until May because we don't want to get interfered with. We're going to plan the whole thing. We're going to hire 1,000 recruiters to get the best talent from communities all over the country. We're going to have little clever things like Patriotic Polly goes on television for 15 seconds saying, get up, get up, America needs you, or whatever. And Patriotic Polly has 14 million email followers, you see. <laughs> got to use animals. Anyway, it's got a lot of humor. It's got tension. It's got the ogre. And... In the middle of it, when they were starting to succeed, it goes right up to the White House and Congress. When they're starting to succeed, Buffett's flying from Miami back to Omaha with an aide in his private jet. And he looks to the aide, he says, you know what? We're getting this done on $15 billion. That's less than a third of my wealth. We're changing this country. We're finding the community leaders. We're giving people a sense that they can regain their sovereignty. We're unleashing the solutions. They're, the media is giving us all kinds of free media because they know we're wealthy. And just to make certain, 
Barry Diller bought a whole string of radio and TV stations around the country. Now people say, why did you take 730 pages to do this before it was abridged to 450? Because I made it credible. Detail, strategy, tactic, rebound, anticipation, counterattack, personality problems, everything. We took a, a redneck district in, Col in Col Oklahoma where the guy has been representing it, the chairman of the Rules Committee, very powerful, had the people in the palm of his hand, all kinds of pork, all kinds of rah-rah, and the challenge was, how do you defeat him? That's what I put the challenge before me. And there's some pretty interesting techniques and rallies and rhetoric that was used to undermine and defeat him. He was considered unbeatable. Now, when I sign the book, I say, to imagine is to envision. If you cannot imagine a future, you cannot envision real possibilities. And we don't do enough imagining. We don't do enough utopian thinking. See, that's what is possible, the scenario of the future. So when you have a conversation after the weekend with anybody, just tell them, what if you had $15 billion one year and 17 very powerful billionaires on your side willing to use all their contacts, all their strategic brains, and their Rolodex uh, with no conflicts of interest? What would you do the 15 billion? And you know what that, I mean, first of all, their jaw drops, right? Like, our imagination is always restricted by the statement, there isn't enough money. Where's the budget? How do you hire people with no money? Therefore, we never unleash our imaginations, right? So just start that. I, and, and first of all, you may be very surprised by the first response. As I told you, I did this with students, and it was embarrassing. And here's what I suggest you do. In the book, Only the Super Rich, I devised a silent period where they would be around the table in Maui, in the hotel, planning their next month's action. And there would be a silent period when they would sit around the table and no one would say a word for X number of minutes for contemplating what they were talking about. So you want to say to people, because it's a little unfair to catch them off guard with a question that never, they never heard of before, tell them, Try to spend 10 minutes thinking, and I'll, I'll get back to you. So, I mean, I've given away my, my approach, but we have to start, start asking ourselves these questions. How do you take over Congress in 10 easy steps? How many people do you need? What do they have to give in to make it happen in every congressional district? Do you know what's out there in terms of Monitoring Congress for the general interest? Almost nothing. There are auto dealers, insurance agents, NRA chapters, APAC chapters, uh, some women's rights chapters. But the overall omnibus performance of Congress is not on the table. And collectively, they should be replaced because they have failed collectively. And you just can't say, well, I, th this person is good. I'm going to. I'm not going to replace. They should all be replaced. They have repeatedly failed on the most fundamental responsibilities that they have under the Constitution, including the declaration of war, and to provide budgets, to monitor the executive branch, and to pass long-needed legislation, and to move to temper the corporate-dominated economy and the Wall Street down. I mean, you, you just name it. It is a miserable performance. It's below D minus. They're paralyzed, avaricious, self-seeking collectively. There are always some good people. But there comes a time when you have to take responsibility for the institution of which you're a part. And if you're not fighting it and organizing people all over the country, you should go down with it. Yes. 
Uh, you mentioned about that the states are kind of starting to take the minimum wage issue. Yeah. I was kind of curious what your thoughts are in terms of if now's the time in terms of the states need to exert their influence over the federal government and kind of take away some of the powers of the federal and bring it back to the state level. Well, the states have plenty of authorities they're not using. In fact, the people have plenty of rights they don't use. You always want new rights, but a lot of them have rights they don't, they're totally underutilized, including the voting power. Uh, so I, I, I think they have a lot of uh, influence, except, let's face it, the biggest money is collected by the federal government, and they have things like revenue sharing and all kinds of things like that. So I would make them prove themselves within the areas that they have rights and, and jurisdiction before I'd give them any more. Um, and I would take away them setting the rules for ballot access for federal office. That, are, that should be only one standard to get in the arena to run for Congress or President. One standard, not 50 state standards that drive you crazy, uh, complex, detailed. Unfortunately, that's what the Constitution very generally assigns, um, but it can, it can be changed. I mean, it's a little vague. It could be challenged, or you could have um, them agree to an interstate compact. But you know, you know, it, it takes tens of thousands of dollars just to run for president, just for the paperwork. You know, just to the the, the, the software costs a, a lot of money. They force you to buy certain uh, software. Have you all heard about the coming end of the electoral college? Okay, here's an example. There's a, a fellow in California, Steve Silberstein, and a number of others. They said, why don't we start getting legislation passed? And the first bill was passed in Maryland. And it basically says, we pledge that we will assign our electoral votes to any candidate who wins the majority vote, who wins the popular vote. So now, California has passed it, New York has passed it. They're up to about 170 electoral votes. So once they get it 270, it's gone. Interstate compact. Handful of people. A couple professors bankrolling it a bit, one bill after another. And uh, it's going to be interesting if the powers would be try to challenge it in court because the states have the right to set the rules here. <laughs> I mean, they're going to be in a real quandary. So, for example, Al Gore won the popular vote by 500,000 in 2000. Under this reform, he would win the electoral college vote. No more shenanigans. No more disgrace where the guy comes in second in a popular vote becomes president. We're a laughing stock in the world. <laughs> That's another example of, a, of an initiative, easier than you think. I mean, look how far they've gotten. And a very small number of people. I'm sure it polls well. The, the Electoral College is not very popular uh, among regular people it, because it seems absurd to them. Do you know that not a single American has ever voted for a presidential candidate? No, you vote for the electors, people you don't even know. What an, what an antiquarian vestige. I mean, to be a prisoner of that sort of thing is crazy. You say to people in Europe, you know, not a single voter's ever voted for a presidential candidate. So, what, what are you talking about? And you try, to, you try to explain the electoral vote. You say, how can you put up with that? In our country, you know, you, you get the majority of the popular vote, you get in. You may have to have coalition government, but you know it's the popular vote uh, that counts. Uh, all right, now just we're gonna. Where, where, where is Arthur? Is he here? He's busy. Okay. I'm gonna put out here five or six action projects and uh, jot down the ones you'd like. Here's here's what I'd like you to do. And we can go into it tomorrow. This is actually getting it done in your community or getting it started. The Cub Project. 
you're going high electricity rates in Massachusetts, it's really coming in high, this is the time to get the legislature to pay attention to a totally voluntary, non-tax supported, citizen advocacy, non-profit group with economists, organizers, publicists, and lawyers to represent utility consumers before the regulatory commission, before the legislature, and public opinion, just like Wisconsin and Illinois and San Diego. That's one. The second is those of you who want to do a none of the above in your community. This one is fun. That's not that hard. Town meeting type government. I doubt whether you're preempted. But if you are preempted, just take it to the state level. This one comes in over 80%. What is the waiting time? What is the waiting time? You want to have it binding. If it wins, let's say it wins for a legislative seat in Massachusetts. Cancels the election, and you have a new election with new candidates. That's what happens. Has to be new candidates? Has to be new candidates, because they were defeated by none of the above. You don't get a second chance in the same round, okay? So you have to check the law on that. You got lawyers here, you can check it. The third one is the $2 club showing up. You get nice logos, nice buttons, $2 club. So when you want to get a turnout, you have a predetermined agreement of people to show up a certain number of times. You have to figure, how do you want to con configure it? How do you want to define showing up? Is it just for town meetings? Is it for demonstrations? Is it for both? I mean, I'll leave it to you, figure that out. Fourth, this is the one I really want you to help me on. How do you use the internet to start new nonprofit advocacy groups on matters for which there is no organized citizen engagement. And my favorite examples are biotech and nanotech, but there are others. And what we need are 10,000 people to, to give an average of $30 a year to hire the full-time people necessary to start breaking ground in this area. Nanotech is in 5,000 products, you never see it, and they all tout the benefits. It's gonna direct the drug right to your cancer without getting your entire body. They never talk about risks to workers, never talk about risks to their technologies. They never talk that they can develop drones now as tiny as a beetle that they can put in your hair to subject you to surveillance or on your windowsill looking like a beetle, like a Japanese beetle. That's just the beginning of nanotech. It's, it, it's beyond science fiction, but it's here. And it's subsidized overwhelmingly by tax R&D dollars. All right, so that's the one. You show me how to do that, those of you who are good on computers and Networking, forever, forever grateful. The fifth is have a FOIA prize in your high school. You get a, a teacher in social studies, and they're, they're going to teach the students how to use the state and federal Freedom of Information Act, and, you know, it's ready to go. It's tiny print, but it can be put in a more presentable graphic form. They will never forget it because they own it. They're writing a letter to a government official saying, open up your files. You shouldn't be secretive. This is completely type different than, you know, civics. Our government is made up of three branches, <laughs> legislative, executive, and judicial. No wonder there was a survey of high school students about 20 years ago where more of them knew the names of the three stooges than the three branches of government. Six, start civic training clubs. 
this is a real lot of fun. You start a nice social club, and with all that involves, and you become more and more expert. Just like you want to start a pottery club, you want to start a stamp collecting club, whatever it is, you see yourself getting better and better with all the great materials. And finally, is this. There's a small town in Alaska that needed to raise money without raising taxes for something, I don't know, a truck or something. So someone got the bright idea of having an election to see which pet becomes the honorary mayor. Okay? So it was unbelievable. They made national news. They elected a cat. And the cat has a nice place in town hall. And the cat is famous now, not as much as the one from the subway in Boston. This is a serious cat. Okay? And then a community in Kentucky of 1,200 people ran an animal pet contest for honorary mayor, and they raised 20 grand. This is a poor area of Kentucky. 1,200 people in the town raised 20,000 bucks. So let's say you need a new snowplow, and the down payment is 50,000 bucks, and they won't increase the mill rate, and they won't give you the budget. And there's a nasty anti-tax group in town, as you know. Put forward, find out how they did it in Alaska. They'll be happy to help you. And put forward a proclamation that you're going to have a primary and a general election. Because you have to have a primary because people are going to offer their cats, dogs, canaries, ponies, whatever. You could restrict it to four-legged animals if you want sheep, and, 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 and two people win the primary, two pets win the primary. And then you have the general election, and that's where you really get the juices out. Because one clique wants to win, right? And every dollar is a vote. This is the ultimate commercial election. So someone says, I want this dog to win. I'm putting down 50 bucks, 50 votes. But the cat lovers say, you know what? You're no way you're going to get a canine as honorary mayor of our town. And it starts a very friendly, amusing, that bridges left, right, and all the meanness in local politics. Right? Why don't you try it? Guaranteed you'll get a peace story, especially if you get a cute pet that wins, that has some personality. <laughs> and you tie it in to uh, something the town needs very much. So there's a practical uh, goal for it. OK, do you have it all down? So pick one, and then Arthur says you have certain parts of this. Tomorrow morning, you have certain parts of the, uh, of the room. And you think about it overnight in terms of how are you going to configure this and how are you going to get it underway. Some, are, some of these are harder than others, like the nonprofit groups. 10,000 people. Others are a slam dunk. The FOIA in the high school is a slam dunk. I mean, it's just a matter of going down, going to the principal, getting to the teachers. It's over. You know, what does it take? And some of it is in between. And one of it is really uh, high theater, which is the honorary pet, the honorary mayor of Rowe, Massachusetts, is a bulldog, <laughs> see, or a macaw parrot. See, that has a good uh, delivery, you know. <laughs> In Rome, Massachusetts used to have the first commercial, large commercial nuclear power plant. Yeah. 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 I know that. Closed in 1991. Yeah. May it never live forever, <laughs> the waste. Um, so is that okay? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you go back and you get it done and then this will really help the Rose Center because Arthur is a very serious, savvy person. And he does not want just personal self-improvement. He wants the Rose Center to be known as a, as a civic 
uh, training session where you go from discussion, deliberation, into doing, to getting things done, getting things underway that could be models that could be replicated around the country. So that, that's... And you don't need the government. And you don't need the government. And nobody can stop you from doing it. Uh, it's really self-defined and self-initiated, depending on your energy and creativity, how many people you get on board to help you, and the like. Now, the bottom line of all this is you have to feel that seeking justice is fun, gratifying, and the greatest way to live. Then you don't think of it as a chore. You don't think of it as dull. You think of it as fulfilling one of life's great possibilities. Because as Senator Daniel Webster, long ago the senator from this dear state, once said, justice is the great work of men on earth. That's his exact words. And you know, without justice, you can't have freedom or liberty. The generic value is justice. And uh, so you, you and, and when you break through and you win here and you win there, it really is the greatest feeling you can ever have. Because you'll be recognized for it legitimately and you want to do more. And I, I, you're probably way beyond this exhortation because of the things you have done. But I've met enough of you, although I do have this idiosyncratic, I do like to eat in silence. So forgive me the people who came and, Steve, forgive me. Where's Steve? Okay. Give me, give me, give me your ideas on the the, the ad, the Baltimore Sun ad, yeah. later. Um, <laughs> and uh, but I, I know enough that there really is a, a very impressive scatter of talent here, and of achievement and experience. So, you know, if you can't pull it off, who, who's going to pull it off? I mean, we're not. This is not Mission Impossible. The one who I really would like you to help us on is the model on getting 10,000 people. How much initial investment? How do you go about doing it? How do you take the first 1,000 and multiply it? Uh, we know how to set it up. We know how to, you well, know. You already have 40,000 Twitter followers, so you've got a, a leg up on two yeah. people. But naive me, I'm told that you don't use Twitter followers that way. It's really strange, the protocols of courtesy in the internet. It's like, never turn them into activists. You upset them. <laughs> so, but may, that may be wrong, but that, that's part of the input. It's done all the time. It's done yeah. all the time. Sure. Very successful. Okay, that's what... Okay, that's what I want to know, because you're looking at someone. You're looking at someone. Where is the T here? You're looking at someone who has no email, no computer, no computer. I work on an Underwood typewriter. When lightning knocks out the electricity, I'm the only one working. Yeah, I have a secret for that. And uh, I can re-ink them. And, uh, and uh, I'm not into this internet because I don't have the time. I don't have the time to deal with emails and messages and this and that. The, the average person at work spends four hours a day uh, answering emails. It's very efficient use of the boss's time. And, and um, the other four hours forwarding them all to everyone. No yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, we have computers wall to wall in our office. And, we have people who never are seen reading a book. They're always looking at the screen. And so that's the way they want to live. Let them live that way as long as they produce. But they don't produce as much as they used to before they had a screen. I can tell you that. Not only that, they, know how to, they knew how to spell. They didn't have to rely on a spell check. And they knew what uh, meeting someone at quarter of 12 meant instead of 11.45. They knew how to add, subtract, divide <laughs> themselves. And um, they knew how to write better. You see, when you can erase so easily on a, on the computer, 
you get sloppy on the first, second, third drafts. I don't like to erase on the Underwood. It's a nightmare. <laughs> so I really discipline myself to, to try to do it on the first round. Uh, however, you know, they can do what they want. If that's the way they want to live, they want to walk down the street, 16th Street in Washington, looking like this. I caught up with a young man, and I said, it's a beautiful day. You have birds in, this, in, this, in the trees, and all you're doing is doing this. Don't you feel you're a prisoner of this? He said, yeah, I am a prisoner of this. <laughs> and, and we reach a cross street, and I'm saying, uh, you know, this is a cross street. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. And I turned left uh, to leave him, and I say, see you later. And he says, yeah, see you later. He admits he's a prisoner, right? They want to live that way? Let them live that way. But you don't have to do the same thing. You know, this is, this is only going to get worse. You get 10 hours a day of young girls saying they're on the iPhone, seven hours for young boys. Do you realize how serious that is? Well, also, too, as you well know, that all the people that hold those phones up to their head will likely end up with brain cancer at some point, especially young people. Well, the verdict is out on that one. It's a long-standing exposure, and they try to tell us uh, the first sign will come from the Finns, because they're the ones who started earlier and most of it. But you know, there's going to be a lot of other guinea pig situations metastasizing from new technologies and gen genetic engineering. How about this? Monsanto says it produces higher yields, and uh, it. Uh, it's cheaper, better, produces higher yields. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. And yeah, and the weeds are now uh, becoming super weeds. <laughs> well, now yes, Monsanto has, has produced an even more virulent herbicide because the weeds have mutated and have become more. I once talked to a big corn farmer in Iowa, and I said, why did you go genetic engineered corn? He says, because I can spend more time with my family. <laughs> See, but now the weeds are coming back. But the other thing is, suppose you're a farm next to his farm, and you don't want GMO, and it pollinates the non-GMO farm, and you can't sue for trespass. They, they sue you. They'll sue you. Yeah, they'll sue you. Yeah, you remember that farmer in Canada? And uh, they're very militant, uh, Novar. I've called Monsanto the most dangerous company in the world. What they're doing in India is transformatively criminal. You're also not allowed to get your blood tested here for um, any kind of Roundup, illegal here, but you can have it done in Germany. You can't even have it done in Mexico. Well, the academic scientists can't even get the material in order to analyze Monsanto products because it's proprietary and they'll sue you. If you look at the contract that uh, farmers signed with Monsanto, it's total serfdom, totally one-sided. No rights on the farmer, totally one-sided. And so that's where we're going, so. I just want to have a quick question about the whole GMO thing, because I saw this, and I think Bernie Sanders posted this on his Facebook page. He said that the FDA says that GMOs are safe because there's no difference, but the uh, Monsanto has these patents because they're so different. <laughs> so how is there this disconnect that one part of the government well, is one thing and the other. Well, None because you, you, can, you can patent hybrid corn without GMO. I mean, there are a lot of hybrid uh, biologies within the species to make better, different kinds of apples, and you, you can patent all those. That's why they let you patent. But in genetic engineering, you have cross species. You can put a mouse gene into a food product, and they just have, they don't, they're flying blind. And uh, they feel nobody can trace it anyway. The government isn't investigating. The academic scientists can't do their work because they can't get the materials without fear of suit. Monsanto is all over the universities. And corporate science is dominating academic science. Corporate science is not peer reviewed. It's proprietary. It's secret. It's politically powerful. It has narrow commercial vo uh, roles, goals. Whereas academic science is supposed to be open, self-critical, peer-reviewed, and have broader visions for new technologies, not just what will sell in the short term, 
however deceptively marketed. Now, there's a new book out called The GMO Deception uh, by, just came out by uh, Shelley Krimsky, who teaches at Tufts. He teaches at Tufts, Shelley Krimsky, K-R-I-M-S-K-Y. He, he's a science uh, historian, science ethics, and written a lot of books. What's it called? The GMO Deception. It's a reader, right. There's good con 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 contributors. And you can see Scientific American basically said 10 years ago uh, in an editorial, this is Scientific American saying that the GMO industry is so secretive that they cannot be given credibility for their claims because they don't, they don't allow the evidence to be disclosed. Anyway, I wrote the introduction. I want you to read that introduction if you're interested in the way to take on a new proprietary technology. What, how, how, you, how you take it, how you deconstruct it. And it's the same with all technologies. They all follow the same pattern. All corporate technologies follow the same pattern. They have secrecy. They make claims they refuse to justify. They try to suppress con contrary, re sorry. They try to suppress contrary uh, Research, for example, when I took on the auto industry, they had touch base on all engineering schools. There was no engineering research base criticizing conventional automotive technology for safety. They would give grants to MIT, to Rensselaer, to Caltech, and they, would, they made sure there wasn't any PhD in automotive engineering the way there was in Europe. You, you would take mechanical engineering or aeronautical or civil engineering, but not automotive engineering for the biggest operating technology in the country, no. And so there was no technical output. There was no technical critique. And they got away with it because there was, there was you don't have technical critique, you're not gonna get regulation. And they had the standards system controlled by the Society of Automotive Engineers, which was a society funded by the auto companies. The committees were auto engineers from the auto companies, and the research arenas were automobile facility, industry facilities. So, you know, you, you begin to learn step by step how to deconstruct the process and throw the balance, the burden of proof on them. See, they succeed because they basically say, we don't have the burden of proof. You have the burden of proof to show that our technology is unsafe. Well, you can't. You don't have access to do it. And so you develop a construct where you uh, go on the offensive and shift the burden of proof on them in specific ways. And you see the whole dynamic change. Like, I, I, was, uh, I couldn't get on TV on unsafe and speed because you were never allowed to talk critically on, t on television uh, of a car model. In fact, I was told by one producer, if I was going to go on TV, I could not say Corvair. I had to say a medium-sized rear-engine car, okay? So I went to Canada. C Canada, we, Canada has given us so much, and yeah, look what we've done to it. I went to Canada on CBC, and they had this 60-minute type program. I think it was called This Week Has Seven Days. And it was really a great program. And the only, the only person they could get from Detroit to sit on the stage with me was an engineer from American Motors, the smallest company. And uh, so I started this way. They showed a picture of a car. They had a, a car. And the car had a huge horn or hood ornament. Well, most people don't realize is the hood ornament stabbed people at very low speeds. And sometimes people have got hooked by in parking lots at night. It's a spear. So I pointed to the hood ornament and I said to the engineer, could you tell me the advantages of this? And I pointed to the fins and I said, could you tell me the function of this? Well, I mean, imagine being asked that One answer was it helped the aerodynamic <laughs> functioning of the auto. It's totally absurd. The only function of a hood ornament, 
function. We're not talking about insignia. The only function of a hood ornament is to protect vehicles from pedestrians, <laughs> which went over very well on television. <laughs> but it was a small way of shifting the burden of proof and started opening a inquiry into the auto company's culpability on, a, on much more significant uh, safety deficiencies. Well, I can see that. What time is it now? Yeah, that's plenty. I mean, thank you for sticking around so long. And, and so, uh, yeah. So, so you'll, you'll think about these categories and decide which one you want to take and huddle tomorrow and see what we can, uh, we, we can do.